This video is sponsored by Puzmo. Learn more about Puzmo later in the video. Hello everybody, my name is Moreover, currently on the run for identity fraud. You'll never catch me. The astute of you may have noticed that this 2D bird in front of you is in fact not a 30 year old man with a massive forehead and in front of a green screen. Clearly I'm not on a green screen. Cut that out, cut that out! Over three years ago, a YouTuber you probably know of, Ricky, made these videos, where he explained the lore and playstyle of every legend in Apex Legends. And they were pretty great videos. They certainly made my small attention span stay still for a few hours straight. But I did say that it has been over three years since those videos released, and the game has had a few more seasons come out since Ricky last talked about it. And it was around this time of realizing that when I had a thought. It'd be cool to see a part three of that series talking about all the new legends. This is that part three. I reached out to Bricky to see if he would be okay with me making a sort of honorary sequel to his original videos. And after a little bit of waiting, he said go for it. If you want to see the rest of the legends explained, make sure to go check out the two original videos. But for now, pull up your jorts and throw away your newest copy of Modern Warfare 3. This is every single Apex legend explained, part three. I do not fight to be accepted. I fight to be free of your acceptance. Obi Adolassim was born in the year 2708 on the planet Boreas. At the very same moment he was born, a comet had struck Boreas' moon Cleo, shattering it. This coincidental series of events marked the child born that day, the Moth, a marker from a fairy tale that denotes Obi as a danger to all who are drawn to him, as those guided by him will only be led to ruin. He lived most of his life as an outcast because of this, but his parents were still caring for their only son, and sought to uplift him in his creativity and passions. His own mother taught him how to dance, and his father showed him how to build art out of technology. This all eventually led to him finding the underground world of the arenas, where he found his true calling creating beautiful theatrics in the heat of combat. Where there is violence, there is beauty. His family fully supported his newfound passion, and Obi, now known as Seer, became a rising star in the arenas, taking back the title of the Moth and reforming it into something inspirational. After Seer had made himself one of the most famous people in Boreas, he would join the Apex Games, to spread his inspiration and further his theatrical play on a grander stage. Seer's story is honestly one of my favorites in the game, a child feared and hated for something beyond him, turning that negativity and loneliness into a shining star for all to see. It's a genuinely cool story. It's too bad that Seer fucking sucks. For context, Seer, when he released in Season 10, was considered the most broken legend in the game, with a passive ability that allows you to see heartbeats through walls, keeping you up to date on enemy locations at all times. And his tactical? Ooh, his tactical. Let's count the things it could do. When used, Seer's tactical throws micro drones out from his chest in a line in front of him and any enemy hit inside of the line is revealed to all allied teammates, as well as showing their current health. Players hit by it are disoriented by the hit, and take a small amount of damage for their trouble. And on top of all of that, being hit by it also cancels any ability you are currently using. They're getting quadruple funky. <laughs> yeah, you heard that right. Hitting a battery, canceled. Reviving an ally, canceled. My crippling credit card debt, Cancelled, I wish. His oppressive abilities were so bad they had to be nerfed very soon after he released. And even after taking away the damage and the disorientation, he still was the most powerful legend. We haven't even mentioned his ultimate. Exhibit is an ultimate that, when thrown out, creates a giant circle around its starting point. Any enemies inside of that circle are visible to you and your allies for the duration of the ultimate. You quite literally just have wall hacks. Who thought this was a good idea? For the longest time, Seer was played not because people liked his character or his skill set, but because it was quite literally the best, and it was oppressive in the hands of a 3 stack that knew how to use it. You can't surprise a Seer team because he always knows where you are. You can't have a straight 3v3 against a Seer team because one throw of an ult means they have wall hacks for the whole fight. And if at any point you got put in the back foot, you couldn't even recover from it because his tactical cancels you from doing that. It was frustrating to fight against. Seer became the biggest problem and source of hate in the entire game for a while, and that's incredibly ironic given what his own character represents. But thankfully, I have been speaking in the past tense this entire time, and for good reason. Over the years since Seer's release, 
he's been nerfed several times and had parts of his kits changed to make it feel better to fight against. In particular, the cancel ability on his tactical was changed to a silencing ability instead. Over time, these nerfs made Seer go from the best legend in the game to a pretty okay one. It feels like most of the people who played Seer before for his power have now moved on to the newest metas, and those left behind are those that genuinely enjoy Seer for who he is. And that's great, in its own way. Don't be fooled though, Seer mains are still utter bastards to fight against. But hey, I can respect it now. Plus, he's got a big hat. It's hard to hate a big hat. Your passive aggression is noted and disregarded. So, Ash. We have a lot to talk about here, so I'm going to try and keep it brief. Let's start well before the start of Apex Legends when Ash was known as Dr. Ashley Reed, over 80 years before the events of Apex. She was a scientist part of a research team searching for a new experimental fuel source called Branthium to solve an incoming energy crisis. Now, what happened when they found the Branthium exactly? Well, let's circle back to the Horizon section from part two to figure that out. Why did she do this? Well, Dr. Reed was actually a planted agent by the Apex Predators, who found her when she was a lab assistant dealing drugs and meds to mercs in the Frontier's underbelly. She joined the Predators to steal the completed form of Branthium, but once the Apex Predators moved in to take it from the research team, Dr. Reed was left fatally wounded by her own sword after the mission failed to retrieve it. Dr. Reed was near dead, but was given an opportunity by the Predators to become a simulacrum, an artificial body with her mind uploaded into it. It would severely traumatize Dr. Reed, but she chose to take that opportunity. She was uploaded, and Reed became known as the cold, calculating, perfectionist simulacrum known as Ash. Now, Ash would serve with the Apex Predators as a pilot for several years. And how did that go? Well, not, not well. Now, Ash's story in particular from here is a very long one, with a story that spans from Season 5 to even now, so forgive me, but I'm about to shorten this whole thing for the sake of the video being under an hour. Ash's body is recovered before the destruction of Typhon, and for some time she would lead as a commanding officer for the Vision Dynamics Mercenary Corps. Ash later on reunited with Blisk and made a deal with him for unknown reasons that would result in Blisk sending parts of her body into an alternate reality. Later, Lobo, while in search of the source code for Revenant, sought to retrieve the pieces of Ash's head in the alternate dimension, gathering the pieces together to reform Ash. Her body was then traded to Hammond Robotics, who wanted the access codes to the flying city of Olympus that Ash's data held. After they got the codes, they dumped Ash into a dumpster. She was then recovered again by Pathfinder, who gave her a place to stay and called her his girlfriend. Ash, after regaining parts of her memories, ran the arenas for the Apex Games on request of Blisk, until eventually, after a series of events with Horizon, led to her dormant personality of Dr. Reed resurfacing. Ash blamed all of her failures in the past on the more human and compassionate Dr. Reed, and soon after joined the Apex Games to prove that she is superior to not only the other legends, but to herself. Ash as a playable legend has an arc snare that she can throw out to trap enemies, preventing their escape or holding them from pushing. Her passive is an actual data knife, Titanfall 2, baby! That she can use on death boxes to mark the location of the team that killed them. And for her ultimate, she pulls out her sword to slice through the void and create a one-way portal in a line in front of her. This simulacrum has everything you need to be a ruthless hunter. Whether it's tracking down your prey from their death trails, gaining ground on your enemy by cutting through reality itself, or preventing their escape through the means of your tethers. A good Ash can be a menace to fight against as she constantly increases the pressure in a fight, and she even has enough flexibility in that kit to allow for good repositioning and team play too. But despite her cold, calculating persona, I find that most Ash players are far from that. At first glance, you may think that Ash gravitates to those types of players, the ones with the TTV at the end of their name. But for the most part, that isn't the case. Most players I see playing Ash are either on the newer end, who just unlocked their first legend and thought she was cool, or relatively chill players who hang out in pubs and try to have a good time. You really can't go wrong with an Ash in your squad, and to be honest, she's kind of reassuring to have. I mean, look at that face. Don't you feel relaxed with that on your team? Let us begin. Gonna grab a bag, fill it with knives, then beat you to death with it. Margaret Kohiri or as she is known more infamously, Mad Maggie, is the childhood friend of Walter Fitzroy. Maggie and Fuse were known as troublemakers on their home planet of Salvo, getting into explosive robberies and heists together, but the two friends grew apart as they aged. Fuse sought the fame and thrills of blood sports, while Maggie grew more and more passionate about her home, 
seeking to keep it free and independent from the mercenary syndicate. This divide between them would separate the two friends, one becoming a star and the other a warlord, pushing for Salvo's independence with her warband, the Cracked Talon. But these two friends hardly could stay apart, as Salvo, despite Maggie's war against it, later became a part of the syndicate. And Fuse was the representative of Salvo to join the Apex Games as a showing of their new joining. Mad Maggie, furious at her former friend, became hell-bent on reversing this decision and executed a terrorist attack at Fuse's entrance into Apex, causing the ship he rode in on to crash into King's Canyon. Maggie would continue to attack and terrorize Fuse and the Apex Games, but eventually, it led to her downfall as she was captured by the Syndicate. Originally, she was planned to be executed, but one of the Syndicate leaders, Duardo Silva, offered a different option. Force Mad Maggie to join the Apex Games, where she would eventually face execution at the hands of her fellow competitors. Mad Maggie now fights in the Apex Games until the day she dies. Forced to be the villain in Silva's game, Maggie won't stop her fight until the day Salvo is free. Now, playing Mad Maggie in a game of Apex is like wielding a giant hammer. When you're holding it, everything seems like a nail, and my god would it be better if I hammered it. Her tactical places a drill on a surface in front of you that then shoots out flames on the other side. So anytime you're rushing down an enemy and they get to cover, boom, roaring flames, bitch! And if she really wants to get you gone, she can throw out a giant ball that bounces in front of her and disorients everybody in front of it, leaving a trail on the ground that when walked on gives you a speed boost as you follow. Mad Maggie is the breach and clear legend, the woman you call when you just need to break a door down and get to business. Add onto all of that her passive that lets her see enemies she's damaged through walls and a speed boost with shotguns and you have a combination that is the best at getting in your face and pummeling you into the dirt. And Maggie players, they know that. Anybody who decides Mad Maggie is their main is somebody who isn't here to play things tactically or get the best positions. No, a Maggie player is here to sniff you out like the dog they are and run you down until you have nowhere left to go. And as soon as she puts you in that corner, oh, does it get good. If you're the type of player who doesn't care about tricks or complex strategies and just wants to get in and brawl, pick up Maggie, pick up a shotgun, and go tear the Apex Games a new one. You won't regret it. Whew, that's three legends down. How many more of these do I have to go? Huh, and what's the budget for these videos again? Yeah. Well, thank God we have a sponsor for today's video, Puzmo. Ever need a few games to stimulate those wrinkles in your brain? Then Puzmo.com has you covered, with a variety of fun and simple puzzle games for you to work on before you start your day. From simple crosswords to word games and even fun chess challenges, all different ways to work your mind and enjoy your time doing it. Such as Pile Up Poker, their newest game where you try to fill out a 4x4 grid with as many poker hands as you can. Here, let me show you how to play. I start with five cards each round and I get to lay out four of them and discard the last. I'm going to try and get a straight flush on this row here, and at the same time I'm going to try and make another hand in the discard pile too. If you get a hand in every column, row, and the corners, you get to score the discard pile as well. I get some incredible luck and get my straight flush in the second row, and I get even luckier as I set up a second straight flush in the corners. I am getting everything I need for the perfect pile up. I just need to finish the corner and... So, check out Puzmo today! New Puzmo Plus subscribers will also receive a special custom deck of cards designed by Lisa Hanawalt. Thank you, Puzmo, for your support. Now, let's get back to the rest of the legends. <sighs> okay, let's see if you still got a Newcastle. Lamont Craig is a family man from a region called Harris Valley. Lamont made his days as a repairman, often fixing the armor of a Harris Valley celebrity who frequently attempted to join the Apex Games. Newcastle. Despite failing several times to join the games, Newcastle was seen as an idol to the people of the valley, fighting for them on a grander stage. But Rene, the face behind Newcastle, was not as great as he seemed, as he had amassed a great debt to a criminal group known as the Forgotten Families, a group he had sold the region of Harris Valley to, but still couldn't recoup his debts because he failed to enter the games. The Forgotten Families kill Rene and plan to seize the town, but Lamont instead steps in promising to pay off Renee's debts by joining the Apex Games instead. Lamont Craig then dons the armor of Newcastle himself, and joins the games with the intent of repaying the debt to protect his family and his home. But that's like half of Newcastle's story, we haven't even gotten to the other half. 
Before Lamont Craig settled into Harris Valley, he was known as Jackson Williams. If that name sounds familiar, good job, you remembered Bangalore. Jackson was an IMC pilot and commanding officer of the IMS Hestia during the Battle of Gridiron shortly after the events of Titanfall 2. After his sister Anita Williams was stabbed by a militia pilot, Jackson soon recognized that he and his soldiers were being sent to die in a fruitless battle, and deserted from the war, sending himself and his crew to the Outlands to survive. Unfortunately for Jackson, Anita didn't agree with his decision, and contacted the IMC through an SOS. When an IMC pilot named Scryer arrived, he sought to execute Jackson for treason, and when Anita stepped in to stop him, Scryer bombed the town the crew was staying in and fought the two siblings. Anita and Jackson were able to kill Scryer and flee, but Jackson recognized that he would forever be seen as an IMC fugitive, and Anita would never be able to be safe again. When a grenade blew open their new ship, the Hestia 02, Jackson was flung out of the ship while trying to protect Anita, and fell to the world below. Jackson was able to survive, but decided to stay dead in the eyes of his sister so that she could live without being a fugitive like him. He would re-emerge as Lamont Craig, and settle into the town of Harris Valley. And then we get back to now. Whether you call him Lamont or Jackson, Newcastle has a kit befitting his protective nature, with one, two, three shields to use in any given fight he's in. Whether it's his mobile shield he can dynamically move and use as cover, his castle wall that creates a full wall of cover for his team, or his revive shield that gives you cover as you revive allies, and allows you to reposition while doing it. Everything about Newcastle is defensive power, and players who enjoy Newcastle know how to use his kit to keep every sightline covered. Except there's one thing that irks me about Newcastle mains. They always prioritize the revive. They'll ignore that last man standing who's one shot to revive the one teammate down even though he only has a white knockdown like, come on, please use your gun. But other than that, having the bulk of Newcastle is always a great thing to have, especially since he also has a 15% damage reduction like Caustic and Gibraltar. There's nothing more reassuring than a big, strong man picking me up when I'm down. <laughs> the human head weighs 4,540 grams. Less with a bullet hole, of course. The wild one named Xiomara Contreras was born on the planet of Pagos, a barren world that her mother Xenia landed on when she escaped her imprisonment on the crashed Gaian ship, the GDS Vantage. On Pagos, Xenia taught her daughter how to survive in the frigid wilderness and told her to live her life under two mantras. Everything is out to kill you, and that she must survive. However, her life would take a turn when she stumbled upon the crashed ship her mother was once imprisoned in while hunting. While exploring the ship, she stumbled upon the corpse of a bat she killed, with the bat's child nestled underneath. The young bat accidentally activated the ship's systems, and caused it to collapse. This left Ziomara critically injured, and her mother, left with no other option, called the Gaian authorities to receive help for her daughter. Ziomara and the bat survived, but Xenia was taken back into custody, where she would serve the rest of her sentence. Feeling guilty for her part in her mother's re-imprisonment, she sought to join the Apex Games to spread the message of her mom's innocence. Despite her inexperience with society as a whole, her marksmanship and hunting skills drew the attention of the Syndicate, who brought her in as the next legend for the Apex Games. She would take on the call sign of Vantage, and fight to help her mother go free. And you know what? I love this little gal. A lone survivor is suddenly thrust into a brand new world, taking on every new challenge head on as she learns how to fit in and find her place in it. God, she's just so goddamn good, I love it! Vanish has quite literally no filter on her and says exactly what's on her mind. And even six seasons later, I still love it. Did you know flyers mourn their dead? Neat, right? Vanish's kit is the perfect one for her solo survivor style as well. Her headpiece has a scope that allows her to zoom in and see the shields of enemies in her sight lines, letting you know how many people are in a squad too. Her pet bat Echo from before now acts as a guiding point for Vanish to jump to for her tactical which creates a ton of reposition opportunities. The highlight of her kit, however, is her ultimate, the A13 sniper rifle, which comes with five shots in total and deals 50 damage per hit, 75 on a headshot. And when you hit an enemy with it, they become marked with a 15% damage vulnerability. And every subsequent shot you hit deals two times damage. Add onto all of that the ability to scan both beacons and you have the most flexible legend in the entire game. With a long range weapon always in her pocket, a powerful movement ability, and scanning knowledge to boot. Vantage really just has it all, and because of that, she's become something of a go-to legend for anybody solo queuing. 
her independence allows Vantage mains to really go off and do whatever they want and still be able to perform. This does tend to create a tendency of Vantage players not being around for important team fights, but that doesn't always matter as much when the Vantage mark two players and knock the third from a mile away. So even though Vantages aren't the biggest team players, they're doing their best. And their best can be a lot when played right. So you keep doing good, Vantage mains. Just stop staring at my hiding spot with your laser, I'm scared. I am the grim trans witch your parents warned you about. Tressa Crystal Smith was at one point in her life a rebellious child who enjoyed practicing witchcraft and crystals with her fellow sisters. But that life soon changed when her best friend Margot took their rebellious tendencies to the extreme. Margot was a girl who was unhappy with how the moon of Cleo was being treated as it was crumbling apart, and one night convinced Tressa to sabotage one of the mining operations that was expected to be sent to Cleo by Hammond Robotics. What Tressa didn't know was that Margot planned to plant a bomb on the mining ship. That night ended with Margot and the mining operation blown to dust, with Tressa escaping as a runaway fugitive. After years on the run, Tressa was able to find her escape from Boreas by joining the Cleo Recovery Council an organization created to lead the terraforming and resettlement of the destroyed moon. An effort that helped to create a new home for the lost girl. It was here that she helped to rebuild the moon her dear friend cared for so much, and also mastered the use of ferrofluid, which allowed her to help with the rebuilding efforts with moldable structures and prevent accidents from being fatal using it. It was truly the only place she wanted to be in. That was all thrown out from under her when the Apex Games were announced to be coming to Cleo. The Recovery Council was terminated, and everything Tressa had helped to create became the next battleground for the Outland's biggest blood sport. With no more money coming in from the loss of her job, Tressa joined the Apex Games as Catalyst to support herself and her sisters, her terraforming equipment being repurposed into a deadly tool to take out against the games that had taken everything from her. There's actually quite a bit more to Catalyst than just this, as her story layers onto Seer's story, both being from Boreas and sort of a trail forming from Seer inadvertently causing the games to move to Clio and so on. It really goes to show that pretty much every new addition to the game adds new layers to the ongoing stories in Apex, but we'll get more on that later. For now, let's talk about Catalyst in-game. Catalyst in a live game of Apex has one major tool to work with. Goop. The Pharaoh Fluid, or Goop, she uses can be used to reinforce doors to prevent enemies from getting through them. You can throw Goop at the ground and trap enemies in it, and you can even make a giant goopy wall that prevents any scans through the wall and severely hinders anybody passing through it. She has a fantastic kit for a controller legend, able to hunker down in any building and prevent teams from pushing into you, much like Caustic, Watson, or Rampart, except that Catalyst has a lot more flexibility in how she can do that. Whether you're out in the open or in a tight corridor, you can just toss your goop anywhere and find some use out of it. Cat players know that and can reliably turn fights in your favor with a well-placed wall and a simple goop trap to make an impossible situation into an amazing one. I'm always happy to see a Catalyst in my squad because I know when somebody picks Cat, they're here to do everything they can for their team. That or they have a Blahaj sitting next to them as they play. I have a very particular set of skills, unfortunately for you. August Montgomery Brinkman was at one point in his life the billionaire star of the IMC Thunderdome. A young man, brash and selfish, was the first ever celebrity to rise from the blood sports in the early Outlands. But his boasting and arrogant way of fighting eventually caused his teammates and brother-in-law to die in the arena. After his death, August spiraled, secluding himself in his mansion and drowning in alcohol and sorrow, ignoring the needs of his wife and son in the process, who eventually left him behind. He would have lived this way until the day he died, if it wasn't for the news many years later that his son, Nathaniel, was set to join the Apex Games. Not wishing for his son to follow the same path he did, August made a deal with the Syndicate leader Silva. He would return to the spotlight for one final encore in the Apex Games, as long as his son never set foot in the arena. Once Silva agreed, Ballistic joined Apex to dance his final song. To keep his son safe, and to enjoy one last thrill before his days are spent. Ballistic brings a level of refinement to Apex we haven't seen before, and a level of experience in blood sports that very few of the Apex legends can share. A fact he loves to remind people of. You really thought you belonged in here with professionals? You misguided sod. SHUT UP! The theme of Ballistic is all about guns, as he can carry a third weapon in a sling on his back. 
The sling weapon doesn't have any attachments, but gives you an extra tool to work with in a fight. And you can take away that same tool from enemies with the Whistler. A smart pistol TF2 reference. that targets an enemy and when hit by it causes their weapons to overheat on use, dealing damage to them when shooting for too long. So he can have an extra weapon and he can overheat enemy weapons. Let's complete this trifecta by giving him better weapons. For his ultimate, he brings his fists together and activates the Tempest, granting him and his teammates faster reloads, faster movement speed, and infinite ammo. On top of all of that, your sling weapon gets upgraded to a gold weapon for the duration. You happen to have a Havoc in that sling? Well, now it's a turbocharged Havoc. Got an extra RE45 in the pocket? Hammer points, baby! It's really hard to hate having a ballistic on your team. Who doesn't love free ammo and faster reload speeds in a team fight? It feels downright unfair. In fact, no, it is unfair. Ballistic mains are unfair. A 1v1 against a ballistic is downright torture. I can't shoot him because he overheated my gun. I can't track him because he can strafe faster. And he can put two clips of an R99 into my ass before I can reload once. God, I hate it. Ballistic, he's a fun legend. But my god, Ballistic Main, stop 1v1-ing me. I can't take it. Ever get the feeling you're not alone in the room? You're not. Wait. What? So this one needs some context. Apex for a little while ran a series of cinematics called Kill Code, which tells the story of Revenant's systems degrading over time. Hammond Robotics, wanting to prevent their favorite murder robot from degradation, worked with Duardo Silva, who by the way tracked down and took Revenant's source code, to upgrade Revenant into a new version. Duardo Silva, seeking more control over the Outlands after taking over the Syndicate, concocted a plan to partner with Revenant. He would give Revenant control over himself and the power to control an army of his bodies at once. Revenant agreed to this partnership, but noted that the contract didn't actually require Silva to be alive for the duration of it. Revenant killed Silva and regained control of himself. No longer a puppet of another, he went on a rampage with his new army against the Legends, choosing now to live as long as he'd like, free from control. After staging his own uprising and terrorizing the Outlands, Revenant stays? In the Apex games? Yeah, it's not actually clear what happens after the events of Kill Code. Revenant just goes back to competing in the games and everything just kind of moved on. The Apex Legends storyline has really moved on past this point and it's not entirely clear what Revenant's been doing, but it certainly hasn't been an army of murder robots terrorizing the Outlands. So, yeah, guess he's just doing it for the hell of it. Fair enough. The new version of Revenant is quite cool, however. They expanded upon his climbing and sneaking ability, as well as added the ability to mark players who are low HP to his passive. His tactical has been changed to a new movement ability, where you charge a pounce to jump forward, and his ultimate is a 75 HP shield Revenant surrounds himself in, and getting a knock while in his ult refreshes not only his pounce, but the shield as well. If the old version of Revenant felt too passive or unaggressive, this new Revenant is the exact opposite. His playstyle changes entirely to a more aggressive roamer, able to close the gap quickly and overwhelm you with his extra shield health. It makes for a far more active playstyle for Rev, and it feels genuinely good to play. I do want to say that I have severely simplified the story of Kill Code here for the sake of brevity. There's a lot of stuff in that storyline that I didn't point out, like how all of it ties back to Mad Maggie's storyline versus Silva, or the source code fight between Loba and Revenant, or even that Silva is actually Octane's grandfather masquerading as his father. There's a lot there, and if you're interested in it, I highly suggest watching the series and checking out the story yourself. Revenant, though, I like it. It's a good change. And player of the game is going to it! Wow, yeah! A planet by the name of Nexus was at one point in time ruled by a brutal monarchy. A hated leadership that had caused a revolution to form to free the people from its tyranny. In one such battle during the revolution, a Monarch-class Titan was called in to defend a town on Nexus from destruction. And during the battle, the Monarch detonated its Titan battery, destroying the enemy forces and heavily irradiating the area around it. Despite the devastation, the Monarch's sacrifice became a symbol of hope for the people of Nexus, which eventually led to a victory against the tyrannical government. Rowena Valentina Coffe Devina lived through this conflict and watched the events of the Monarch detonation firsthand. But now she and her family were living in peace. Big fans of the Apex games, Rowena and her siblings would dress up as their favorite legends and watch all of the games unfold. But that all changed when Rowena's sister Diwa would come home with a terrible injury to her arm. Unable to work, their family started to fall behind on bills. Rowena, 
wanting to help her family and fulfill a small dream of her own, ventured into the irradiated zone and took the remnants of the monarch's titan battery for herself. With the battery, Rowena, with the help of her community, fashioned a combat exosuit powered by it, and started to compete in local fighting rings to support her family. Her success in the local arenas eventually led to her invitation to the Apex Games, a place she dreamed of being in. But there was one problem. The radiation from the battery was slowly killing her. But Rowena, now conduit, would not let that stop her from competing in the games she loves and helping her family in the process. But who knows for how long she will be able to do it. Conduit's abilities in-game borrow from the Monarch Titan in TF2, being able to target allies to grant them temporary shields, even through walls, and her passive allows her to see the shield health of her allies and catch up to them with a movement speed buff when far away from allies. And finally, her ultimate is a set of batteries that shoots out in front of her and bounces into a line. After a short activation, the batteries kick on and create a barricade that damages and slows enemies inside of it. Conduit's really interesting to me, since she is somewhat of an opposite of Lifeline, trading her revive abilities and additional supplies for more active healing and crowd control. I find that players who gravitate towards Conduit are those that originally did gravitate to Lifeline, but want to have a more front and center role in fights, being able to cover the initial damage instead of the last of it, which can be pretty fun to play with. It feels great to see your teammate's shields break and immediately pop the Q to cover it. Conduit feels good to play, and while frustrating at times to fight against, is a pretty solid addition to the roster. But she should really get that radiation checked out before she becomes a death dwarf or something. What, that felt so personal? Are we friends now? And last, but certainly not least, is Alter, the newest legend in Apex. Well, actually, no, she is the least. In fact, we barely know that much at all about Alter. Ying Ling Liu is a trans-dimensional trickster who travels to realities on the brink of destruction living and doing however she likes, and leaving just before the collapse of that world. Reveling in the chaos before hopping to the next, Alter has now landed in our dimension, crashing onto Broken Moon as she entered the world of the Apex Games, ready to see another world collapse unfold. But according to Alter, it has something to do with Horizon, and her search for a way to turn back time to be with her son. What happens next? Well, we have yet to find out. But we do have a new legend, and she's pretty cool. Alter has a bit of a Joker-esque vibe with her trickery and made-up stories. Every person in every world asks me the same thing. I wanna know how I got these scars. What's surprising, however, is that her kit itself isn't quite so... tricky? Her main tool of choice is a portal that she can place on surfaces to pass through allowing her to enter blocked buildings, fall underneath floors, or even jump up to rooftops. This ability is genuinely incredibly cool, and I love it. Best addition to the game in years. But the rest of her kit is pretty... meh? Her passive lets her take one item from death boxes at a distance, and for her ultimate, she places down a Void Nexus, a fallback point that every member of the team can interact with to teleport back to the Nexus's location, even when you're not. Again, I really like this ultimate, but it doesn't seem very fitting for a chaotic, dimension hopping trickster to have such a team oriented playstyle? I don't know, maybe I'm weird, but it just sticks out for me a bit. Kind of like how Revenant felt more passive in his original iteration than his murder robot persona would be. Still, Alter is a pretty cool and wild addition to the game, and her implications for the greater story of Apex are also really damn cool. I didn't realize until I started making this video how much the addition of new legends to the game has evolved over time. Outside of a few, most of the legends added have related to ongoing storylines in Apex, and each edition has added something new to it. And while some threads are more focused on than others in the Apex storyline, there are so many open opportunities for Respawn to add layer upon layer with each season. And it actually made it pretty hard to make this video since there's a surprising amount to cover. It's genuinely crazy to have a live service game like this having so many ongoing storylines still developing and evolving over time. And yeah, not all of the stories are favorites or as interesting as others, but it's still a testament to the dedication Respawn has to the Titanfall and Apex universe that they continue to grow and evolve it in new and unique ways. And it does leave me excited for where they will take it next. Which will be Mirage being the main antagonist for Titanfall 3. Please, Respawn, make it happen, please! Yeah!